Well, Pardon? got to remind you about Tom Cruise this <laughs> we are recording now. Okay, <laughs> we'll do the Tom Cruise. Oh, I will just move that camera, I haven't I? Right, so, all right, we're, we're on, right? Hello. Oh, okay, the Tom Cruise, the Tom Cruise story. <laughs> <sighs> I need to do a, a lot of this with allegedly and apparently. Tom, so for background for people, when we were talking the icebreaker, we were, oh, in fact, no, we were talking before the icebreaker off air about certain things with the media and rumours and stuff about people not being nice. Mm. Tom Cruise, so if you're not aware, all of my father's side of the family, all in TV and film, right? Almost everyone's in TV and film. Oh, I see. And uh, right up to my, my granddad and my grandmother. And one of my family members, mm. due, I don't even want to say when, it was a long time ago, her friend, her best friend at the time, when Tom Cruise was in town in London for A, another reason, doing whatever, production, awards, whatever, her one of her jobs, so she would be responsible for looking after his needs and wants when he was over here. Okay, yeah, okay. so like personal assistant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. Right, and allegedly, <laughs> one of the things that she would be asked to do on a regular basis would be to um, procure gentleman company for Tom Cruise oh. on a regular basis. Interesting. Yes. Wow. Well, it's a, it's... It's one of these open s secrets, I think, is it not, with him? Allegedly? Allegedly. I actually know very little about Tom Cruise. I've, I've, I think I've seen one Mission Impossible film. Yeah, it's that. What an actor. What an actor. Yeah. What a talented guy. And also fearless. I, have you seen him do his own stunts and just... Yeah. Did you see the one with the motorbike off the... Yeah. <sighs> I know. Absolutely. I know. Bonkers. And yet, and yet, beholden to Scientology. I wonder Ooh. what it is they could have about him that keeps him there. <laughs> I wonder what the dirty little secret mm -hmm. is that keeps him there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, not to go in straight into this podcast with someone in the same industry and start slagging everyone off. Allegedly. <laughs> Jess Nesling, pleasure to have you. Thank you. Really good. Me. Really good. Thank you. Um, right. Let's go on to a bit of a darker topic here. Mm -hmm. We were talking on the podcast, on the icebreaker. One of the questions is, have you ever found yourself in danger, fear for your life, fear for others around you, etc." cetera? Um, you said yes, and then proceeded into talking about, uh, basically you were, you thought you were gonna get mugged. Mm -hmm. Someone next to you got mugged. You were there when a lady got mugged by a group of males. Yeah. And then you went on to describe <laughs> a couple of other events touched mm -hmm. on those so you've experienced this three times at least as yeah. a lady in london uh definitely it's probably closer to double figures to be honest but it's one of those things that it's now the first time what was the first one i think it was the hammersmith one um where that guy followed me and <laughs> where that guy followed me and uh tried to grab me to kiss me at the station it was very that was intense that was horrible um but it's now become so normal that when I'm with friends, we'll just sit, have brunch, have coffee, and be like, oh yeah, this happened. Did you hear about this situation? And you know, someone, uh, a friend of a friend was going into her flat and there was someone, a DPD delivery guy said, oh, there's this for, for flat blah. And she went, oh, that's not, no, that's not for me. That's my flat, no. He was in disguise and he tried to attack her and he followed her in and grabbed her leg to the point where she was bleeding and she like slammed the door and he was trying to genuinely trying to break down the door and she had to call the police it was like and that's that was in brixton so it's but this is just kind of it's like oh yeah this happened this happened and it's just said in such a sort of desensitized way but as you said that for you the kind of it's like the heightened situations that aren't really London based. <laughs> you know, the reason I want to ask about it is because I, mm. I exist in this bubble. It seems to me now like a bubble, right? <laughs> Which I don't want to believe it's a bubble. I exist in this, it's this, my reality in my world is most people 
are decent, good people. Yeah. Most men are decent, good men. Absolutely. Right? And, and we grew up not far from each other, right? Yeah. In South Wales. Mm -hmm. And where I grew up, so for example, I've never ever experienced or seen a woman getting mugged. I've seen it on TV, I've seen it on YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, or wherever. I've seen it on, on a screen, right? I've never experienced it in real life. Yeah. I've seen men getting beaten up. I've seen fights happen, that kind of stuff. Never a woman. Mm -hmm. So, and that's not me saying it doesn't happen. As long as you fucking does. Yeah. But... I've just always thought it's a rarity and and I also want to believe that it's a rarity but when you were talking iceberg and you're talking there if it's happened to you or you've been around it so yeah. not saying you've been mugged a bunch of these times but you've had experiences to do with this direct real life experiences to do with this observe someone else or heard someone else happen mm -hmm. to someone else or you in the street just yourself a dozen or more times yeah. that that to me is bonkers. That means that it's literally a major, major, major problem. Yep. Major problem. Yep. You, you live in London, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, well, isn't how do you deal with it? You can't because what what can you report? What can't you report? What well, is dealt with? What's not? I've I've never reported anything that's happened to me. Um, yeah, that's, Why not? that's Why not? the thing. It's just. It, it can't, what's the point the, the amount of effort that uh, it's just like uh, genuinely there's no point it's just a bit of paperwork that goes round and nothing happens you get a sort of you know a reference number no, no action is taken so there's no point putting my energy there because i know that nothing it's nothing's going to be done like um tatty mcleod who's a, a fabulous comedian french english franglish comedian she got mugged outside finsbury park station Posted about it on Instagram. Uh, hundreds of people came back. Yeah, I got mugged in exactly the same place. I know about, everyone knows Finsbury Park Station, you take, you have everything close because you, the likelihood is you are going to get mugged. Police have done absolutely bugger all about it. So what's the point in reporting it? Because it's, it's just going into the ether. Oh, I did not know that yeah. about Finsbury Park. That's Holloway, right? It's, that's yes. Victoria Line, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Is it? Uh, no, Finsbury Park, yeah. Victoria and um, Piccadilly, is it as well? Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, it's just... Piccadilly line, Piccadilly line, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I think it's both of them. But yeah. yeah, it's just, there are certain hot spots. And even though they're known, nothing's done. So what's the point in putting my energy there? I'd rather just find ways to sort of be more resilient. <laughs> See, the, the, what I would say to that is, mm. if it's not reported, yeah, right, and this is me as a bloke, if it's not reported, <laughs> then the, there isn't, overwhelming evidence to force people to do something about it mm. because ultimately it costs money right yeah more people more security i, I don't mm -hmm. know but without it there they can it doesn't appear there's a problem on paper but, but that's the thing they know that there are problems as i said mm. there are these hot spots there other people make these and it, it just you know i i'm very like it's not just london my sister when she was how old was she was she 16 or 17 got beaten up on a bus in swansea and she is quiet, she's calm, she wouldn't, you know, she's the most gentle person. But because she was wearing a black coat, this girl was going, fucking goth, fucking goth. And Sarah rolled her eyes. That was enough for her to jump on my sister and smack her in the face. Oh my Sarah God. pushed her off. The boyfriend went, don't you fucking touch my girlfriend like that? Started punching the lights out of my sister. Scum of the earth. The bus driver did nothing. No one on the bus did anything. My mum then tried to take it further with the police to be like, this needs to be sorted. The police genuinely made it out that mum was trying to do it for the compensation money. Mum was like, I don't give a shit about the money. It's my daughter I care about. And she, she was so upset. The whole process was so upsetting that it's like, it genuinely, what is the point? It's, you know. Oh my it's God, the, it's yeah. so sad. It's yeah. so sad to have to be resigned to that attitude. I'm not saying the attitude I want. But like, it's, yeah, but it's, it's through just. Through experience, you know. Absolutely. What you know. on earth? People are... I, Oh. It's, I even, there was a situation random when I was living in my old place and, um, I sorry, I laughed just because I just remembered the state agent's response to it, but, um, we had this ridiculous shite little gate and we had a front, front garden and we kept asking if we could have a higher gate just because all the people going past, it was in, uh, um, Highbury and Islington. So all the football people going past for Arsenal would chuck their rubbish into our garden and we genuinely have to litter pick after a game it's annoying so we asked for a higher gate they didn't do it 
the this group of people i just heard this scuffle outside i'm a freelancer so i'm often in in the day <laughs> <laughs> so much free time for this freelancer <laughs> um but i just heard this scuffle outside i heard the gate go and i looked out and these two guys were pinning down a third guy on my like um pathway and this woman was screaming for them to stop and i was like what is going so i went out and this this guy was genuinely about to stamp on this guy's head i was like absolutely not and i called the police someone walking past saw they called the police too and to be fair the police arrived within minutes but there was no follow-up no check-in to see what was going on the guy that was on the floor got arrested not the one that was smashing his face in like there was blood on my drive on, not my driveway on my um, path and i was so shaken by that nothing like no follow-up no check-ins and i i think i'd phoned to try and find out what had happened and there was there was just no like nothing just whoosh, gone so I, i'm just permanently like there's <laughs> genuinely i'm not putting my energy there it's just it's mm. a shame if i knew that action would be taken of course i would but it just feels like you know they're just the response is oh yeah here we go yeah yeah, I think if I was to go and ask this question of some of the police guests I've had on the pa in mm. the past, they'd say, or well, definitely one of them, Ian Donnelly, would say, this is basically a resource issue. Really? Where police have been so strip, stripped back. We did, yeah. all, we did an old interview about it. Mm -hmm. Where police have been so stripped back in the UK that they haven't got enough people to deal with everything. Yeah. So only it's five, like NHS, I think it? it's only 5% of crimes that are reported get investigated. 5%. 5%. It's, oh, it's terrible. It's a really low, it's a really low figure. It's yeah. a really low figure. People who remember that podcast, listen to it, they're going to fact check this, but it is five, maybe it's 15%. I'm pretty sure it's 5% Below. get investigated because they, they haven't got they just, the, the resources to do it. Don't yeah. have the people. Literally, I think 50%, is it, of police stations have gone compared to 15 years ago. They, ju they just can't do everything. So yeah. I think it's a case of they need to prioritise. Yeah what they should investigate and maybe that that assessment is done on okay which ones are we most likely to be able to catch the culprit or culprits yeah. and bring about a, a confident prosecution on it maybe that it's, that'd be part of it right yeah um and what's the cost of it how long it's going to take yada 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 but it's, that's the thing it's from the other side <clears throat> something that's you know like we were saying with the mugging and all that stuff something that is seriously anxiety inducing and that you feel shite about yourself about like you know the, the fact that you've witnessed it it's sort of like trauma that it causes but then you get the response of we're not prioritizing this that mm. then has an impact so it's like i'd rather just yeah i can't imagine know. living in that state i mean mm. it that's not to say that in certain circumstances a bloke would get anxiety or get a little bit concerned when they are walking down somewhere there's a there's a group of yeah other males mm -hmm. In behaving in a certain way you know on the on the interesting when you spoke on the ice break and you said before that for that where you thought you're gonna get mugged you went past a group of lads yeah thought you're gonna get mugged and they actually ran past you and mugged the lady in front of you yeah but before that happened you had you said the hairs yeah, in the back of your yeah. next to them you're not sure why yeah but do you know what i think that is this is why i think there's hope for humanity when it comes to ai right? oh yeah so there's things you can't teach yeah. so the, the hairs in the back of your neck there are you so through your, th this is what I think, through your thousands of years of, of evil, our thousands of years of evolution, mm. your brain just tuned into tiny, 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 imperceptible things about your environment yep. and people in it that all come together, like five, 10, 15, 20, like micro signals, yeah. which you can't even perceive to the naked eye, but you're taking them in nonetheless when you walk past that group of lads. Yeah. I didn't yeah, even put them all together and they, they go were behind me they yep. were behind me oh, I didn't, they were, and i just had it's this like weird, danger yeah danger and he just goes danger in it yeah yeah and it's i feel like sort of over the over the centuries that that sort of actually knowing what those micro signals are and women has been women seem to have it more as well they, 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 they're the, the sixth sense isn't it but yeah. women seem to me to have it better than what blokes do which mm. would make total sense because women generally are vo more vulnerable than men yeah aren't they so it's you that know, kind of heightened awareness yeah, exactly more, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so that's why you took a boxing that's why yeah yeah and it's because i was looking into doing 
self-defense hilariously the self-defense class i signed up for got cancelled <laughs> um but by the police <laughs> possibly <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's uh i was then looking into sort of like more martial arts and i just thought oh god it just, this sounds bad but like it just gets so expensive as well and it's like i just want something so that i've got a bit more confidence in it just you know if anything were to happen <laughs> so yeah boxing is the the one that i took up and i was gonna have one-to-one -one sessions when was that two years ago i was about to sign up for them and i got a year-long tour ah so it's like you know i just ended up just doing classes when i could but i was out of i couldn't commit to going regularly so but yeah i'm back in i'm going tomorrow and oh, it's yeah. just i've got my own boxing gloves now oh, awesome. <laughs> but i just i just want i think it's not just about having that skill it's a confidence thing i think there's a certain if people are looking for someone to mug, they're going to go for someone who is going to let go of that bag. Do you know what I mean? They're not going to go for someone who's necessarily going to put up a fight or like, you know, so I'm trying to have that about me, which is yeah. why, as I said, I've changed the way I walk. If I'm in certain situations, yeah. I will just tense everything and just I mean, be the, ready. The, uh, the, the one I would always suggest, I'm not saying the boxing is a good one, but it's a, mm. any, any martial art. I yeah. think I think everyone should do something, yeah. male or female. Everyone should do something, and, you, and the one reason being the confidence thing. Yeah, there hasn't it just it the confidence and calmness. Yeah, and then understanding what you're capable of, but also what other people are capable of. Yes, right, and just makes it just makes for a calmer world, less anxiety, less pressure. For me, doing a uh, martial arts, I started off doing jujitsu, mm. and then I went into boxing. It was time and stuff like this, but when I don't do it. My confidence takes a massive hit. Interesting. Yeah, massive hit. Yeah, yeah. massive hit. I just feel le I feel less confident mm. just because I'm not doing it. Yeah, and that's and that is for for a bloke. That is purely down to in the back of my mind thinking, if I'm attacked by another guy, I'm less likely to be able to defend myself or the person I'm with, my missus, my kids, whatever, in danger than if I was if I had that capability. Yeah, that, that is literally yes, yeah, that that's primal sort of protective instinct yeah. and also that like a bloke doesn't want to be vulnerable yeah. no one wants to be vulnerable no one, yeah. the less so for a bloke mm. um but for a, for for women the one i always think is the best one for women if you're gonna if you if you had a choice you can, I could pick anyone and it was convenient is jujitsu and the reason being is that i think for a woman most of the time if you're attacked is you're gonna end up getting restrained pinned down whatever in that kind of way mm. and Jiu-Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is all about being able to overpower someone bigger than on you. that, yeah. yeah, that that, but also on the ground. It's predominantly ground on the ground, ah. on the ground. So yeah. you get comfortable with um, being in a situation where you are pinned down with. So you're on your back, and someone is literally straddling you, pinned your arms back, and you're in those situations all the time in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and you're sparring all the time in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. So for a woman, that's highly likely a, a position you're going to be in. Mm. When you find yourself in that position, all of a sudden it's not helpless, fear, like a Just fearful un, yeah. lack of control. You're like, oh, I've been here before. I was in this position in the, in, you know, in the gym last yeah. week. I know exactly what I'm doing. And yeah. I can tell this guy, who's the way he's positioned his body weight and all that, he ain't got a hope in hell. And then you yeah. snap his arm and you're out of it. Nice. But, that's, yeah, um, yeah, but like I said, anyone but jujitsu. If of any of them, I'd recommend jujitsu. Yeah. Have you done? Do you spar when you're boxing? Uh, I was. That's what I was going to be doing, but I haven't. I've only just done it with a massive bag yeah. and just smacked the shit out yeah, of it, yeah. which Feels is good, just it? really satisfying. It really <laughs> yeah, is. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. It's but it was it was after after the Sarah Everard awful situation. Friends were posting about like um, that knuckle was, dusters that, was that looked like that was jewelry. a copper, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. People were posting like knuckle dusters that look like jewelry, so you can get away with wearing them. It was like, and uh, pepper spray that's easily accessible, like, you know, uh, not pepper spray, sorry, it's like legal alternative to pepper spray. And, you know, did you know that if you had your deodorant can, that's not seen as a weapon, you can still use that and it's still, you know, it's like all this stuff came out and it was just, I don't know, it's just like, it's, it is very in your face at the moment. It, and I think, it's great that it is, but it's also just like, it's just such a shame that we have to think about these things on the daily, you know? Mm. Yeah. But boxing, I love anyway, it's great, but it's just having that extra, 
as you said, the confidence, the fitness. And also, like, I, as I've said to you with that situation, I knew that something was going to happen and I was prepared. But then when it did, I froze. And it's like everyone goes fight or flight. It's fight, flight, freeze. And I don't want to be the person that freezes in that situation. And, um, yeah, so it's just building up a new... <laughs> The other thing is, I think a reason, a, a re, I think a reason a lot of the time that people stand by and f oh, film it or stand by and do uh, nothing, yeah. right, is because they don't have, they don't have the confidence, the capability to think I can step in there mm. and try and make a difference here. Yeah. For sure. And, you know, yeah. he was a boxer, I maybe feel like boxing yeah. out maybe if there's a situation where there's another lady and having a yeah. problem well, that, that you could potentially yeah. go in and help help out as opposed to be doing nothing yeah because the amount of people doing nothing it beggars belief and blokes it's doing funny. it it beggars belief genuinely when i was a teenager i was in um uh oh, what's the precinct in no, not Brimmill. anyway in sketty near sketty um and this old woman was screaming help and it was you know, busy Saturday, just people strolling around. This guy, she got out of her car. This guy had just leaned in, taken her handbag from the passenger seat and was just walking through the crowds and all these big blokes just watching. And she was like, he's got my bag. No one did anything. I was living, I went to run. My mom went, don't you dare. And then I was, I, I was so incensed. I just started sprinting after him and only then did he start running. Chased him to his back garden. I was like, I'm not going into the property, but at least I know where he is told the police about that they sorted it out uh turns out he was also a local drug dealer so they when they went in blah, blah, blah. but um i was like why am i a teenage girl the only one that's taken action here and then there was there was a woman from the shop she was like i know you i know you <laughs> she was coming after me and uh she yeah so we both were just standing i was and she was going to go in i was like don't don't go in but yeah only like why why is it two young women the only, of like probably about 50 people there. We were the only two that did anything. Crazy. Absolutely. Just, I don't understand it, it. But that's like, I've got this kind of over active sense of injustice. I hate injustice of any form. Like I hate it, but it's kind of. There is blinding. something where there is something in, like, in defense of people. There is, if you mm. put yourselves in the position of someone who's, someone just run past. And someone's screaming, you go, oh, what's going on? You Takes don't really know what's going it. on. Yeah. You know, you don't know what's legit or not. Yeah. And also, if the majority of other people are having the same the same thought, then the majority of other people are also doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's more out of place to do something about it. It's, you know, yeah. you'd literally have to see it from the start. But I don't know. Me, I wonder if it, if it, if it was like this twenty years ago. I have no idea. No, I, I I don't. I'm trying to think of any s scenarios. I can't I can't think of any. I don't know. It's it's hard. Um, there's, there's a brilliant film about like a similar thing. It's, I think it's called Avalanche and it's, is it an Austrian film that was translated or dubbed? I watched it. I did. I, I don't normally watch TV and film, but I watched so much in lockdown. <laughs> this was one and it's about a family who are on a holiday and there's an avalanche that comes down and they're all just, you know, at Prey Ski, that sort of outdoor section. And the dad just runs away and leaves the mum to look after the kids and he won't own up to it. And the whole film is her trying to make him and it's she, that neither, she can't let it go. And it's just, it's- So it's after they've got out? It's, yeah, it's kind of the situation happens and then the whole, the rest of the film, she's just like, can you just admit? And he's like, I didn't do that. No, I was there with you. And it's, oh, it's, it's really, it's a great film. It's a great, I've, you know, I don't want to give too much away about it, but it's really, the psychology of it is fantastic. It's really well done. Mm. I think it's called Avalanche. It would make sense. Yeah, that guy <laughs> sounds like an arsehole. But that's it. He was just a perfectly lovely bloke and just in the situation, he did. He panicked. Oh, that's right, it. Yeah. That's the kind of, the viewpoint that they go for. And she's just such a submit and he can't because his ego gets in the way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like things like that, those that happens, right? P people have different responses to things. But I do yeah. think you can train it out of you. I was gonna, I was gonna ask this. Like, mm. is that something that happens? So, in, uh, the reason I think you can train it out of you because I serve, well, I've served, served, and yeah. in all of the times, in all of the times I was in life-threatening situations, mm -hmm. many, 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 many oh, times wow. with lots of other people or w around other people. Mm. Um. I think I own, I saw, I saw freeze once. Yeah. I saw it once. So someone freezing. Yeah. 
and I heard of someone else doing it once. So in my entire time, I, I've only ever experienced two or heard of two people in total mm -hmm. who froze. I've never experienced people running away. Definitely not. Mm. Most people fight. Yeah. And that, so the only reason, so that, that must mean, because people who join up come from all, like they're very similar. They come from all different like backgrounds and demographics and they're different kinds of people and different personality makes up and different, different experiences and different levels of confidence. When they start, Yeah, I started, I was a lettuce. I had no <laughs> confidence. I was nothing like I am now. Mm. No, really no self-esteem, no self-confidence. I've spoken about it before. Yeah. No self-confidence. No, definitely not physically capable, apart from I was great at running. <laughs> um, and you fast forward, I never froze. I never, definitely never fled. It yeah. was always fight. And most, well... You could say 99.99999% of all the other people around me in the situations did the same too. They, they fought. No freeze, no flight. So I think that but do you, you must be able to get trained out of you. That was we conditioned yeah. to do that. But if you're choosing to go into the army, you know that that's the situation you're going to be in, isn't nah, it? Not most of the time. Do you no, think? No, very naive. I was very naive when I joined. Really? I was very naive when I joined. Yeah, but the, the, the reason I think that people in, mo almost everyone, will will fight is because I say condition we're trained so you're in it when you have your first contact you have your first firefight then you're in a position where you you're fully knowledgeable about what you can do to respond yes. to it what yeah. capabilities you have what the what the enemy's capabilities are mm -hmm. so you you like you ha you know you've got all the tools and you know how to use them yeah it's in the same example of you learn the box yeah you know, in that in a um, in a replicated scenario than a line where someone's getting mugged in front of you, mm. you know that you could you have tools that you can apply if the situation is it's, right. Yeah, you can step in it. as opposed to what it was before. You had no tools. You didn't yeah. know how to punch. You didn't know how to throw a punch. You didn't know how to do anything. That's it. It's the same kind of thing. So yeah. you're less likely to freeze, right? That's true, and you're more likely to actually go and. Is that like that book that I was telling you about? Is it becoming bulletproof? Um, the close protection officer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that's her first instinct is to just go into the danger, because, and she that sort of like it's kind of like a heightened state just kicks in. You're so hyper aware of everything that's going on around you. It's like I, I don't know if that's an adrenaline rush if that causes that, and then you're just kind of it's like you can see everything at once, and you're just yeah. Oh, but that's, honestly, that, book that is, is so that is adrenaline, and what adren and one of the impacts that adrenaline has, why it's so important, is mm. it. So you have that, it seems like everything slows down and you're seeing things in slow time. Yeah. But in actual fact, you're not. What your brain's doing is it's, instead of going at 45 frames a second, yeah. it's going like 15 frames a second. So it's snapshotting. Uh -huh. So when you recollect in it, you recollect it in slow motion, you actually recollect it at the time. It's in, it seems like it's in slow motion. It's not, it's just snapshots. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a, it, and it allows you to perceive it in a way that you're going to be able to respond better and deal with yeah. situations. That's and fascinating, the, the impact of adrenaline is unbelievable. Mm. Crazy. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> the limit of my knowledge on, um, on how adrenaline impacts your perception. But, it, but it's also <laughs> just like the power of the imagination in the mind. Like, I don't know if you've seen, but they're using VR to help people who've had like significant burns and to help people with phobias. And have you seen this? No, but I know you've Incredible. done some VR work in the past, haven't you? I have, yeah. yeah. There was there was a company, um, it was my first mocap job actually, well, performance capture job I did um, with Oxford VR. And they were trialing uh, using VR for people with like um, uh, sort of like social anxiety, that kind of stuff and putting them in situations with different levels of um, interactions with people incredible but then just sort of i was doing some research around it and i think there was also a play about this at the national but there were some people who were severely burned in war came back and they were put into cold environments with vr and it was more effective than morphine and it wasn't like they were putting the you know like aircon units around them or anything it was just the vr what do you mean more effective than morphine? Because the they, pain were, relief. They, they, were they were actually they were still injured. They were yeah yeah. So they had like significant you know, oh. skin grafts, all this, and they were just in pain. But being put into those environments was more effective for them wow. than morphine in most cases. I I just like the the brain is like what's whatever's going on in here is just there's it's just fascinating. It is. We are an amazing machine, aren't we? We are an amazing machine. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. fragile, but also. 
bloody awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, just going back, Swansea. Swansea. Alpha, Alpha. 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 Yeah. Alpha, is it? I've always said Alpha. Alpha, yeah. Alpha. From I've always said Alpha. It's uh, the old Welsh for wash house. <laughs> is it really? Yeah. So I went to Dudavelli and that is um, yes. wa- Watermill. Is that Watermill? So yeah, much nice dur, yeah. Watermill. Do you speak Welsh? Uh, I GCSE level. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Did, uh, I've got the, another question I've got is, mm. did you get taught the Welsh National Anthem at school? Yes, in primary school. I didn't. Stop it. I'm not what? joking. I'm not joking. Primary no school way. and secondary school did not get taught the Welsh National Anthem. How we, crazy is that? We had to learn the Lord's Prayer in Welsh in, in primary schools. So I, I could not tell you. Oh, you like, might I'm have done tired. that. Yeah, you might have done That's that. All I've, got. all I've got for you. Yeah. Amen. I feel like yeah. <laughs> you might have done that. But I, I learned the Welsh National no Anthem way. at, I was, I was uh, 31. Stop. I'm not kidding. Because it was, it was embarrassing. I, I, I didn't, I sort of halfway through my military career, I thought, why, the, why don't I know the Welsh National Anthem? Why did I get taught it? And I thought, that's crazy not to get taught it in school. Yeah. I've never asked anyone else if they haven't got taught it, but obviously you did. Yeah. And I was in, I was out of the military, I was working in Iraq. I think the, the World Cup, the Rugby World Cup was on. Uh-huh. About to start, and I was thinking, I, I don't know the words to my own national anthem. And I taught myself it. It was a YouTube video, and it was, I can't remember who was singing it. They had all the, all the lyrics there, and I, I learned it. Oh my God, I was so happy. But now I sing it. When I sing it, I, it's like with the emotion that I've known it all my life. And no one knows. <laughs> no one knows. I only learned it at the age yeah, of 31 years do. old. But how mad is that That's, not to get taught it? Whoa. I don't understand it's, why. You, yeah, I was going to say, especially South Wales, but no, North Wales, they are Welsh speaking. So mm. yeah, gosh. That's, that's a great that's, anthem. It's, I think it's fantastic, I have to say. Best anthem, obviously. Absolutely. No bias here. None at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's my, so my, my parents are both English, but um, they both moved to Wales. Actually, my mum's reason for moving to, well, out of London, she was a casualty sister and she had seen everything that could go wrong with anything. Like she was there for terrorist bombings, for, you know, everything that could go wrong. And she got the final straw, she got held at gunpoint in A&E. And she was just like, I can't cope with the levels of stress. So Where was this? That was in, um, was that St. Stephen's, the one in Tooting? So that she was there in casualty and she was just like, I can't deal with oh this. So God. she started interviewing in like Southampton, Swansea, got a position in Swansea. Genuinely within her first few months, she was held at knife point and she had to go to court and get, and she was just like- in Swansea, was that Morriston? <sighs> that was, uh, yeah, that must have been Morriston. <laughs> But yeah, so, but they, oh, what was I going to say now? I've completely lost my train of thought. Little side quest, come back to the main one. Uh, what were we talking about? It was National Oh, Anthem. Welsh National Anthem. Yeah, so my dad, he taught himself Welsh because he was like, if I'm going to work in Wales and I'm treating patients who are speaking their native tongue, I want to be able to. And he's English. And he's English. What a legend. Absolutely. That's legend. commitment to the job. Completely. Oh, what does he do? Phenomenal. He's an anaesthetist. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, but whenever Wales, England play in the rugby, he'll bet on Wales winning. Cause if England wins, he's happy. If Wales wins, he gets money. So he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the system. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's. Why didn't you follow their footsteps going into um, medicine then, healthcare? I think neither of, the, neither of them really promoted it. Like they didn't push, they, they just very much let us do what we wanted to do my sister's a musician and i'm <laughs> i'm an actress i mean they, they i don't think they were expecting it to go this far but um yeah it's and also my yeah my dad's dad was also an anesthetist and his sister is a gp or was a gp she's retired um there's it's a very medical family um but yeah i think um, actually my grandpa ted was really cool he helped to design uh, christopher reeves Superman's chair after he had the accident. Oh, wow, you mentioned this yeah, actually. We had coffee. Yeah. That's amazing. And he also was really into use of hypnosis to help people, to calm people before anesthetics. And, you know, that. He, he was an oh, incredible man. Um, but yeah, I think part of it was just their kind of like dinner table chat it was so disgusting. <laughs> so this just doesn't appeal <laughs> at all. It was like, how was your day at work? Oh, well, you know, had this and that. And it's like, oh. <laughs> Yeah. It must offer a stability though that the uh, that your work doesn't. I always oh, I always yeah. when I think of people in your career in, in your line of work, mm. 
actors in fact anything to do with the arts yeah actors painters any of that stuff i think oh god it seems to me like it's very very tricky world to to get the same stability you do from a nine till five salary job for example i knew you're saying yeah. you're a freelancer yeah it's like it's uh, and, and especially now so challenging and i think it's only because I, i've been exposed to it a little bit just doing like uh, commission based work for a while and mm. I, I just thought stuff this how do people it's, do this it's tough, it? do you know the origin of freelancer no it's knights uh, who hadn't sworn fealty to a certain lord so they were freelancers yeah I'm just a knight. That's right. That is very cool. That's a good little knowledge, nice, Bob. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Is it? I love yeah. it. What was your first foray into the arts then? Into, uh, well, into... acting. Uh, I'm assuming yeah. secondary school. Yep. Go on well, I, I say that. I had a fantastic year six teacher, Mrs. Meredith, uh, Veronica. I love her. She was amazing. And she introduced me to Dylan Thomas, which love big heart big love dylan thomas oh yeah. what a cad um and we did uh under milk wood in year six Amazing. and i was terrified but she gave me the role of the narrator and i was there like <laughs> oh god da, da, da. and she was so brilliant of she was just really good at sort of bringing bringing you out of your shell in a safe space. I, I went to such a sweet, I went to St. David's Primary School. It was just adorable. I loved it. I loved the kids there. Went from a school, I think there were like 250 kids in the whole school to a comprehensive of 2,000 kids with a one-way system over three floors. And it was like, <gasps> and so it kind of, my confidence was just starting to come up. And then I went to secondary school and I just crumbled. I really did. And um, yeah, so, and I, the, if you'd said to me then you're going to be a performer, I would have laughed in your face. Absolutely would have laughed in your face. Um, but I did a lot of impressions of people and my dad is amazing at accents. And so on long journeys, we'd just sort of do uh, <laughs> some really silly things like in flight, uh, you know, the kind of the speeches from the air hostess for different airlines and stuff. And it's like, you know, just good eye and blah, 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 like all this stuff and like American Airlines and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> make sure your tray is down, you know, all this sort of stuff. Just yeah. so I was always playing around. Um, but I was just really shy. And it got to the point where year seven, year eight, if someone looked at me, I'd like my eyes would well up because I'd be like, <gasps> oh, wow. it was bad. And I'd, I had holes in my jumper where I'd flick the cuff and just have it like that and I'd be rubbing it. And so I had holes where my thumb would go through. Like I was shy um, and I was permanently anxious. I'm <laughs> surprised any of my friends stuck around because I just permanently felt like I wasn't good enough. Like I wasn't, <sighs> yeah, it was, I, I, Why I feel you think like- that is? I, I feel like a lot of kids go through it. I, I don't know if it was the transition. I don't think it's that from, acute. Yeah, that's Maybe it. it's for ladies. It's definitely not that acute for men. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I never quite felt like I fitted in. And it, it was just, I, I don't know, I just felt like it was just, it was just very interesting, but I also just wasn't cool. <laughs> like all for the I was currency. In, I was, was in the uncool cool. gang. Is like oh yeah, <laughs> I just wasn't cool. And it's like, I worked hard, got called a SWAT and it's like, okay, so I tried to not work hard. And it's like, why aren't you work? It was just, it was, I couldn't do anything right. <laughs> and um, I got bullied for not having like Nike trainers. Do you know what I mean? It's like all that stuff. And I just, it was just chip, 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 chip chip at someone who was already very sensitive and so I just became a puddle like like you were saying was you were a lettuce when you, yeah, <laughs> I was, yeah, I was yeah, a little lettuce, puddle yeah. just kind of going around um and so my parents were like this is getting silly so they chucked me into Amdram to be like just, you know let's let's try and do what Veronica Meredith did in year six and just get her out of her shell a bit and I did drop it at the deep end just chuck that me that could in. have gone a long way well it's yeah and at first <laughs> I was so shy like I really struggled and if we had to do like improv or something I'd just be like I don't know the English language I, don't know. I just you know I just switch off and be like I don't know I don't know anything I don't know don't ask me my name uh, freeze I went into flight fight fight flight freeze yeah. and I was like ah. and eventually again I had a fab teacher Jill Williams I think she's still teaching actually she's oh, she's brilliant um but again, in a room where you had the kids who'd done drama all their lives, who wanted to, I still felt down here. And I got given one line in <coughs> Les Mis. Was that the first? Yeah, got one line in Les Mis. Don't go near him, Monsieur Mayor. That was it. And the rest I was in the chorus. Fine. I was like, yeah. Went to do it. And I was like, 
she had to take the line off me. She gave it to Fionn Jones. <laughs> Honestly, I was just a, a little puddle. But then I finally, I built up confidence. I was going to be the strawberry seller in um, Oliver. <laughs> Sorry, this is like my Bridget Jones story, my origin. But um, I was meant to be the strawberry seller and I fell down five carpeted stairs in my house a few weeks before the performance, twisted my foot, I tore everything except my Achilles and fractured my heel. So I was in this moon boot and I was like, oh, my role is the strawberry seller. <laughs> <laughs> ruined absolutely and so I ended up because I had a modern cast she went well we can't have you in a skirt so you're right playing a man so I went from being the strawberry seller to a pervy old man in an old-fashioned wheelchair a bath chair in the <laughs> umpapa scene <laughs> just like <laughs> so yeah that was and I just thought I want to pursue this <laughs> and I didn't take GCSE drama so I couldn't take a level drama <clears throat> my parents said what do you want to do at uni and I definitely wanted to do French and I, I, no, I said I wanted to do drama and they just went, that's a curveball. Can you do it with something? I was like, okay, French and drama. And very few places have that combination. And I was actually one of two people who did it at my uni. I went to Royal Holloway. And even then it's like, I was still shy. I wasn't really part of the cool, cool group. You know, it's like first year drama. They'd all obviously, and a lot of them had come from private schools. A lot of them had done drama since they were, you know, in the womb. And I didn't know anything. And it's like, we'd be analyzing a text and they'd be like, oh yeah, there's something really Brechtian about this. I was like, who the fuck is Brechtian? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, I had no, I didn't know anything. So oh, again, I just felt like I was down mm. there. And it's, it's taken a long time for me to go, no, actually this is, I've, I've just sort of, done a lot of work and just it's for some reason I just wanted to keep going and just keep playing and keep growing in confidence and just the skills and everything that come with it and yeah that's why I'm still yeah, doing but it. But you do all sorts right so you I do. So actress yeah and voice actor yeah voice artist right <laughs> singing yeah singer mm -hmm. singing like in the bathroom singer <laughs> And did I see on your website, you're writing a play as well? I am, yeah. So of all of those, I definitely want to come to the play. Of Absolutely. all of those things, yeah. which, which do you prefer doing? That's, as I said before, like, I can't choose. I love, I love them all. I love, I think something that I've always struggled with is reality <laughs> like just, uh, I, I which just version really, exactly it's just uh, this i'm just not the idea like um, you know until sort of two years ago i was i had to have another job uh i can't i still pinch myself that i'm full-time performer what why why do you because well, no, it's just like it's so hard you know as uh, like the stability as you were saying the financial side of it just so the fact that it is my full-time job and that i've been in this industry 10 years is it like only the last two i've managed to do it um but i love i love the variety i love it i love the fact that i can be doing a video game shouting as a french savant like the, you know in warhammer one minute and then the next day i'm doing gangster granny performing as a cabbage in front of like you know a theater you know it's just it's i forgot just, you did gangster yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but this is yeah. it's just and like you know i've got a sort of little side hustle that just came from me writing my own show reel scenes that i write show reel scenes for other people now so it's like that's honing my writing craft which is great i just i i love flitting i love i've you know i've got it suits my attention span as well because i i just can't i like I did the nine to five and I'd, I'd come away just feeling drained. And of course there's a side of it that that's not what I want to do. It's not where I want to be. So of course it's not going to fulfill me in the same way, but I just can't do routine. <laughs> I can't do it. You know, it's, I just, I really struggle with that. So I think having a career where things are different, I'm permanently learning, permanently growing, working with different people, visiting different places and yeah I, I love it I absolutely love it I really so do. 10 years so you left uni 10 years ago I assume it's uh I went to drama school in 2013 and did masters masters in acting <laughs> <laughs> so eight so 10 years two years of which you've been full-time freelancer yeah. so how did you balance things 
in the first eight years? And when was your when was your first? Well, I don't want to say when was your first like significant job that you got to you? You thought, holy shit, I could. Ooh. This is I could make something of this. Yeah. So I uh, I tempt on reception, and I, I mean I could write I could write a play about that. To be honest, it's just temp life is hilarious. It is so funny. Oh my gosh, some of the stories. There was there was one place that said she must I think it was I don't know if I could say the brand, but it was a, a makeup brand, but I was in the like HQ and they said she must come in uh skirt just below the knee, high heels. They specified you had to wear heels and I was I mean I I had these clumpy things and and went in. I was building boxes, just storage boxes for them in the in the back room and they wanted me in a feckin' skirt and heels and I was there on my knees trying to and I was just like why right <laughs> so I was there sort of trying to look you know oh god it was ridiculous on my, like genuinely on my hands and knees trying to do all these boxes just like fuck you just fuck you this is uh oh. <laughs> and then yeah um it was it was a tough balance and there was one day uh, I was working with a company that is now dissolved for they were just awful but they uh they kind of they wanted me to stay on permanently and I was like I'm not going to sign a contract, but I'll just, you know, stay on as a temp on reception. So I'd been there a while and I kind of got used to the sort of the culture there. Like it was, the people were just so fecking rude. It was, oh God. What industry was it in? It was in PR. Okay. And uh, it was very- Ironic that they were was, assholes in yeah. the PR, in the PR job. It, yeah, PR it, was, it was like nothing, nothing I've ever seen anywhere else. In, I, I'm- the other receptionist and I went to HR about it and they said, can you just write down what they gave us a book and they said, can you write down the incidents? Doesn't matter how minor you think they are, just write down every incident. We needed a new book after like four weeks. It was genuinely mad. But the, um, I had my first TV audition. I think it was for Endeavor. And I had one line, it was a doctor and I had to say very complicated Latin, like, oh, I'm afraid they've got, hold on, hold on that so I was doing that and I was like I don't need to take a day off work for that so I was in in the morning and it was literally around the corner it was a 15 minute walk walks so all morning I was going oh they've got, blah, 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 blah. Oh, they've got blah, 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 doing that and uh then the boss the big boss decided to scream at the other receptionist of me for not telling him that a room was free it had been booked and someone hadn't cancelled it we didn't know we'd set it up he was like oh do you think I could do all my meetings in my office blah, blah, blah. scream 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 and then his his PA came over and was like, why didn't you tell? And I said, I've got to say, like being shouted at in front of clients who were raising eyebrows in front of other guests, I was like, that's not fair. I don't care if he's the top boss or I don't care who he is. I'm, not, I'm not being spoken to Good like that. You. And she went, I didn't, I didn't realize. I'm so, I'm going to, let, let me say it. And she was sweet. Um, she went off to get him. He came thundering down the corridor. This man's like four foot in a fart and full ego. And he comes thundering. Apparently I've been rude. Do you know? I own this company. I'm the top. I went, yeah, that's great. What's my name? And he's veins everywhere. And he screamed at me to the point where people were coming in just to witness what was going on. Oh and I, I went from confident to like everyone witnessing it. And I just started shaking. And I was like, Alex, the other receptionist, we, we were both in tears because he was just horrendous. Like the stuff he was saying, he was making us feel this big, awful. And then I went to my audition <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was shaking and I like, I got there early just so I could calm down. And the casting director came out and she went, oh, the other person's running late, come straight in. And I was oh, like, no. Oh, I can't say no. I can't say no. And I went and she went, say your name and agent to camera. And I was like, just like, well, I whizzed back like minutes ago. To, yeah. And I, and I was like, uh, it's, yeah. And I looked at the camera and I was like, oh, Je uh, my name's Jess. <laughs> my name's Jess. <laughs> like literally crumbled. Then I had the one line, which I'd been doing all morning. I can't remember. It was like some Latin, blah, blah, blah. And I went to do it and I'd forgot. And I literally had the paper and it was going in my hand. And I was like, you, you've got of course I didn't get the bloody job mm. not just that I haven't been seen, seen by that casting director since oh no in it god so it's like all these bloody temp jobs you should be able to just walk away and ugh um, but yeah it was and also it's things like if you are booked for a week with this like job if you're booked in Monday to Friday and you get a commercial audition on Tuesday morning they will cancel you for the week because they want the same person in 
So you'd lose a week's work just to go into a commercial audition where you are genuinely there for probably three to five minutes in the room and you miss a week's work for that. It's mad. It's a mad lifestyle. Why do you do it? I genuinely question that myself, but <laughs> it's, you know. Well, the thing is, you, the reality is, I would assume you can't, well, we know, you can't just step into, oh, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm full time, a full time actor. You can't yeah. go from, you know, zero to hero straight away. So they have to try and balance the books Absolutely. somehow, don't you? Yeah. And, you know, well, you will know that of people that they'll be all day going from audition to audition or just doing some self development, whatever, learning lines, just, I don't know, whatever during the day. And then the night time, going working somewhere all night yeah you know in, in extremis yeah and then trying to turn up and do an audition oh, when they're you know it, where they just come from whatever situation like in, in your example yeah what an arsehole that guy oh absolutely and they exist all the time yeah and do you know there was um there was a guy who did like the the room setups and he sort of did the catering he's the <clears> head of <throat> catering really interesting fabulous man and uh, it came out in the news that there was a huge scandal about this company. It was all over the news. There were interviews. It was, oh, it was, and it, hilariously, the irony was the head of this PR firm was being interviewed and it was an absolute shambles and people were just like, you're meant to be. Anyway, that all happened. And I went, I'm not surprised, saw that coming a mile off. I was in, where was I, Sainsbury's? I was in a supermarket and this guy just sidled up next to me and he was like, did you hear the good news? And I turned around, it's the guy from catering. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> he was like, isn't it fabulous? I was like, yes. Brilliant. We all knew. Oh, God. Shocking. So what was the first job are you proud of? You think, first oh, job. my God, na that was a hard one, and I nailed it. So there were two. There were two. Um, my first ever Shakespeare, and it's. I still, I'm, I'm, I'm about to go into rehearsals for another one. I still feel like an imposter with Shakespeare. You feel like you've learned to load, and then you realise there's so much more to to uncover and to, to bring out of a text. And it's just uh, a minefield, but fun. And um, my first, it was my first ever tour as well. It was Rich the Third with a company called Antique Disposition. And I was playing Queen Elizabeth. And um, it was intense. It was amazing. We did a cathedral tour of England. Then we went over to the south of France and did an outdoor tour there of it. And what do you mean a cathedral tour? Performing in performing cathedrals? In cathedrals oh, how in cool England. is that? Oh, it was so much fun and beautiful. There was one, I think it was Bristol. We added 25 minutes to the running time because the echo was so intense that we had to slow down. Wow. Every, which felt weird. Um, but yeah, then we went to the south of France and I remember in rehearsals having the imposter syndrome. I was like, come on, break through this. Come on, come on. And learning Shakespeare is so much harder than learning a modern text because it's kind of like poetry and it's not language. You you can't, if you, you can't ad lib <laughs> very successfully if you forget <clears throat> it. Um, and there was this scene where I was arguing with Richard III and it was and I kept on being like, oh, what's it? And, and it was like, you know, you're meant to have like a Rizzler thin space between lines it's da -da 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 -da. but i was like Ugh, uh. and then we were performing in one of the cathedrals and toby who played richard skipped a line and without even thinking about it i came in with the the line after that so it was like nothing had happened awesome and, memory he, straight yeah. in there. and i was like <gasps> <gasps> okay it's there it's there that was like a, a good moment because you basically you're avoiding a trip in front of the audience there, right? Yeah. You could derail the whole thing. Yeah. His mistake, like, but you managed to... It just, and we just managed, and both of our eyes, we were like, oh, okay. And then we just carried <laughs> on. And he, he just, afterwards, he just sort of grabbed my arm and was like, <laughs> bless him. He had like a tome to learn. He was in sort of the whole thing, just doing monologues and, oh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, he's phenomenal. Um, but then the next year I did Blythe Spirits with Changeling. And I played Elvira, who's a ghost. And I just remember the audition. Um, there was this <clears throat> woman who was mad as a box of frogs who was in the waiting room. And I was quite nervous because I was like, oh gosh, another tour, this would be really cool. You know, doing uh, Shakespeare and Noel Coward in rep, fabulous. And this woman was in the waiting room and 
she was just like, oh, are you feeling nervous too, darling? You're feeling nervous? And I went, yeah, a bit, yeah. And she was like, do you know, apparently if you power pose before going in for an audition, really helps the confidence, just does something inside, do it with me. So all these other people were lucky. We were just there going, yeah. She was like, yeah, just, and she was just chat, 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 chat. And I was just, so when they called me in, I was in this weird, like, hyper space. And then the director said, can you do this particular speech? Like, I did the speech that they asked me to prepare. And they said, can you do it again, but just use every single surface and just like go. And I, I gen, it was one of these sort of like, there was a Northern Irish act, uh, director I worked with who called it wanky actor shit, <laughs> yeah. where it's like touch every surface and just do. And I just went, fuck it. And I genuinely just went for it. And I was like, just rolling around and just doing all this stuff. And I got the job and playing Elvira was the most fun I have ever ever had on stage why is that i just felt free i just the director i was working with just allowed me to just play and discover and it wasn't like oh you're being oh that's a bit too much or da, da, da. it was just yeah right okay roll with that let's try this let's do this and i just you know i had a i had to do a fight sequence with myself in that play it's like oh so it's, it was really complicated <laughs> i'm a ghost i try to kill my husband accidentally kill his wife she comes back no one else can see her in this particular moment but me and so she's fighting me like, how dare you? And I, I'm doing all this like, and I had to fight myself. <laughs> so there's no, there's so no fun. ghost on stage that the audience can see. It's no, literally you it's are fighting me. something My only me. you can see. Yeah. <laughs> and I just, I just had a blast. I really had a blast. Plus the costume was awesome. I had this incredible green and blue wig, but yeah, that was the first time I truly was like, this, this is, I think this is, I'm going to pursue this. Like I, I want to do this. It's fun. It's exhilarating. I love live theater because like in that situation, you've got to figure out how to get through things. If they go wrong, it's different every night. Audience reactions are different. You, it kind of, there are certain things where you expect a reaction at a certain time. If that doesn't happen, you're like, Ooh, why didn't that happen? It's like, it's yeah, I love it. Yeah. So Grant, the last guest was, was, was uh, touched on this. Oh, and, yeah. he, and I hadn't realized until he said about that and you alluded to it there, the difference between like film and a TV program or a film. Mm. So Grant was like, one of the Kajaki actors, mm. right? So that's how we know each other. Nice. And, and now he's, he's, um, he's performing in, Two to two, a ghost story. Yeah, yeah. She's in that, and Brilliant. he was saying he made a really simple point. I hadn't realised. He said, "You're on stage. You, there's no room for error. No, no room for error. You can't do a take. It messes up. Stop. Go again. In let's it. try it this way. Yeah. No, 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 no. You get all you get all of the ways you want to, the ways you potentially want to perform a part or say a line done in the rehearsals and all that." stuff yeah. once you're on stage you say you can't you can't screw up and I, I thought oh my god yeah yes correct but so coming to the lines right yeah how do you <laughs> how do you go about memorizing the lines so from my idiot perspective i would think you can like you would try and memorize anything you can either go right read that line recite it recite it in order until you like you're trying to remember a pack of cards in order yeah. you know or in a or the other way is you you could put yourself into the story and try and connect an emotion yeah. or some kind of feeling with bits the, each part of the script yeah i'm a moron tell me how you do it and how how people do it moron is the welsh for carrot <laughs> <laughs> i'm a carrot top as well yeah <laughs> um i mean i still experiment with different ways of learning uh doing the kind of just sort of sitting, reading it, reading it, reading it gets you so far. But then when you add in movements and when you add in different people's rhythm, because you kind of go, okay, then they sit there a bit and that's that. They then do it a different way. And it's like, oh, so mm. I think that's what I love about the rehearsal process because you're then moving around and you have the muscle memory of like, oh yeah, this is the, the sort of sense of, um, I'm not wording this very well, but like if you, have the emotion and the kind of the motivation for saying it that really helps trigger that oh that's this bit that's this bit but yeah the the number of times that i've done it i've seen other people do it where you just can't remember a word or like there's a bit that just goes out of your head and <laughs> there was a section in it was in blind spirit the woman playing madame arcati was phenomenal charlotte and she completely 
near the beginning of the run, she missed an entire chunk of this thing. But we had two ghosts on stage, someone who was in a trance. It's mad. I honestly love the play so much. <laughs> so it was kind of down to Toby to help her bring back to where, because like we, it was a very important chunk of the play. So it was down to him to sort of help bring it back. <laughs> it was like, we were... Did she I've skip never, ahead then? She yeah. skipped ahead. Okay, right, yeah. But it was right, all the key information was yeah, in this bit. Yeah, a lot of context and So lost. he was then like, Madame McCarty, what about trying this? And she went, yeah, oh, and like went, you know, and it's just, oh, it's, I love live theatre for that reason. And there was a bit when I was doing Gangster Granny where I'm like telling off Ben as mum and I just couldn't remember the word. I can't remember it now, but it's like, I sort of had to climb up his ladder on his bed and be like, <laughs> I'd completely forgotten it. And I was climbing up so slowly. He was like, what are you doing? I was like, you, and, I was like, I <laughs> and it, again, it was meant to be this patter between dad and mum, like, do you, are you embarrassed? Us? And I was like, you, duh. And I saw Justin who played Ben just turn around and look at me and Jason, I could feel go, what's she gonna say? <laughs> And I said something completely different. And Jason just latched on and went, yes. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh. And I had done that play like 250 times by that point, And it still brain wow. farts happen. But yeah, learning, it's, it's just, I find doing it with movement and with intention and with other people, it, it starts to sink in more. Has it become, have, has it become a bit easier to do the process of, learning to learning to perform with the counterpart so like uh, you mentioned it there actually because mm. like, i was thinking oh yeah learn your script it's easy no it's not easy because there's other people in speaking in between you have to try and yeah. visualize the conversation going on or whatever and whatever actions are going on stage at the same time visually mm. um has it become a bit the, the rehearsal process become easier with things like video calls and zoom and things where you may not have a rehearsal plan because of cost and time and money mm. of getting on stage all together but it's not to say that you with a counterpart another actor couldn't rehearse lines via a, a call for example yeah i, I mean, don't know it just popped in my head yeah i, I did um I, I do with this audio drama called ronnie and arwin and um <clears throat> always before we record we'll do a zoom rehearsal just so that we know before we get into the room what everyone's rhythm is going to be, how we're going to deliver, so that when you get into the space, it's so mm. like you know how it's going to go down. Like it's kind, of, it, it's a rehearsal, but yeah, it's kind of yeah. It, it would be so much effort to kind of get everyone together two days in a row. It'd be more timely, cost inefficient, and so having like two hours on Zoom, going through it, being like, oh, that's how you're going to do that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Da, 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 da. You then get into the room on the day of recording and it's just bam, 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 done. <laughs> and it's so much easier. Um, for like theater, I, I prefer being in the room with people because it's, you know, you're kind of, you're acting with everything and uh, especially sort of like comedy things, you, it's just, yeah, I just feel like it's, more helpful and more exciting and more you feel more connected when you're actually in the room with the people doing you know zoom was great for lockdown zoom's great for like long distance but if there is a possibility mm. to be in the room i will always grab it i will always always grab it how do you maintain motivation from show to show to show when you're repeating the same performance over and over and over sometimes multiple times a day for months and months and months so <laughs> it can be tough it can be really tough there, especially like the tool that I just done was a year. Uh, and I actually had a moment on stage where I couldn't, cause we did two or three shows a day. And I, I did that scene year. dressed, yeah. I did this scene dressed as a cabbage. It was this nightmare scene. <sighs> and I was on stage and I was meant to be saying these lines and da, 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 da. And I just had this moment of, have I done this bit already? And then I looked up and all these kids were kind of going, oh. and I was like, what is, what am I doing with my life? Why am I dressed as a cabbage? And then I turned around to Jace, who was my stage husband, and I could see that he clocked. And like, I, you know, I got through it and he was like, were you okay? I was like, I just had the, it was like I was on acid. It was this trippy, who am I, out of body. Everything went a bit wibbly. I was like, what just happened? He went, 
that happens when you've done something this many times your brain goes I'm gonna say you must I... mess with the mind right because you because yeah. you, you're literally living the same reality yeah. multiple times a day which is hilarious for someone who can't deal with routine <laughs> 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 right it's yeah. just oh it's bonkers but that that and also my my character ma'am is so high energy and i found if i sat down in the wings waiting to go on by the time i'd got up it was like trying to go from first gear to sixth you know it was just like Ugh. so i went through a phase of having literally and it was not sustainable a packet of percy pigs a show <laughs> just to percy pigs like haribo it's oh, like, right. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, m, yeah. m s darling and uh, <laughs> i just sit backstage just having them to kind of keep the sugar going and i was like i can't i can't First of all, that is unhealthy. Secondly, it's kind of expensive. There must be another way. And so, bless the wardrobe mistress. She she kind of understood me. I, and I am a bit bonkers. It was a perfect character for me. But in order to keep the revs up, I had to just be weird backstage. So we had these little, like, songs. Like, there were certain things where, you know, uh, something would be happening on stage and we'd be sort of mirroring it backstage and like, dun, 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 like all this stuff. I did not stop. I did not stop. And so it was even more exhausting, especially for three show days. I was exhausted. Just trying to maintain the mindset. Just the trying to stay, yeah, yeah, just trying to stay like revved up so that when I go on stage, it's just like, Phew, rather than, oh God, uh, uh, I just, yeah. Every scene change was a dance. Everything she did was big. I, I just didn't, I couldn't drop that energy i couldn't do it wow, it's, it's a fascinating industry it's mm. a fascinating There's, you could have a whole show about what happens in the wings honestly it's <laughs> it's really mad it is yeah <laughs> the, i mean it, there's a lot of um there's often a lot of hate or negativity thrown at actors who when i say actors i mean male and female mm -hmm. uh actors who I don't know they just they seem to be a bit different a bit there's some personality flaws that seem evident or there's this just difference there's a bit of hatred in that way you think it's completely justified what like what you do is wild you know <laughs> wild you're literally having to pretend yeah but that's what you do you pretend yeah. and and i can't i must imagine that it is extremely rare to be given a role where that is actually what you like in real life Oh, you yeah. never play your own personality. I'd be, I'd be very surprised unless you're, I don't know, unless you've got some extreme, unless you're a narcissist, playing a narcissist. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, Which absolutely. I reckon happens. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. There's, um, yeah, I just, it's always, for me, it sort of comes from a different part of my personality. But yeah, it's, it's you're never just yourself going on stage. There's always preparation. There's always like, you know, physicality, the way that you say things. It's like the whole, so many little cogs that you've kind of got to make sure stay fine tuned all, all the way through. And it it is tiring. It is, you know, and I just think there are certain performers like, um, oh my gosh, Farinelli and the King. Oh, what's his name? Incredible actor. He was also the BFG. He was in Phantom of the Open. Oh, what is his name? But there, there are just these performers who it's like they are a different person and we'll think of his name because he, he was the lead in jerusalem as well i don't know if you saw that yeah. show have oh. a look. i love it now. go on keep talking yeah, Mark, Mark. if i can get a signal <laughs> yeah, the signal in this room um but yeah there are these performers who are it's it's like they're just they are superhuman and i know there was a story with uh, jerusalem where there was a situation in the audience and instead of um, stopping the show, your man who played uh, the lead. Mark. Is it Yale Grublas? No, it's Mark. Mark. Mm. Mark. Go on, <laughs> go on. Anyway. It's yeah. He he. It's the the play Jerusalem by Jez Butterworth. Uh, and so instead of the curtain coming down, your man just sort of stayed, just completely trained in in character. This, this young performer opposite just going, oh my God, he's holding my eye contact. I'm just going to stay. I'm just going to, okay. And they were there for about 15 minutes and then straight away, just as soon as it was sorted back in. And I, I don't understand how you can just hold that moment for that long. I'd be, I'd be going, are they okay? <laughs> are they, have we? Like, 
he just stayed and also bless him his brother unexpectedly died um whilst he was doing the run he took one day off to go for the funeral and then was straight back in in character and i just think it takes a certain level of stamina and emotional strength to do that and i don't think that that's something every performer has no, which leads me on to something else I want to ask you about. Yeah, yeah. The emo the, like the emotional strength. Mm. What is it like dealing with when you're trying to break into an industry and w get roles, get jobs, mm. dealing with rejection? It's it's really hard. It doesn't get easier. You just you're. It doesn't get definitely. easier. Not the, not the rejection, especially like I think initially. You know, I've actively been told that I want they, this particular director wanted to see me. I think I told you this, wanted to see me for the lead in this film, but he wanted someone more ethereal, more waif-like. I went, you want someone skinny? And he went, yeah. Like, oh, God. So my talent's enough, but I'm not skinny enough to be the lead, so I play the care home assistant. Fine. But it's, it's one thing... Oh, so you, you were on the production, but yeah. you weren't the lead? Yeah, yeah. And oh, he, my God. After being told that? Unnamed character, yeah. And he know, told it's me not that like you're a beast, is it? It's, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say so, but you know, it's, that's <laughs> the thing. And it's just like, it's so, you know, I, I got a commercial and I genuinely got it. And the breakdown said, she is so plain. You wouldn't think to look at her twice walking past. And I got it. And it's like, why do you need to say that in the breakdown? <laughs> why do you? So it's kind of, at first, all these things really hurt, and it was just like you'd kind of just people would. Well, you're definitely not playing. It's well, the, but it's do you know like it's <laughs> just playing. it's just one of those things you're just like, whatever. And it's I, I've got my casting. I'm 33, but my casting age is up to 40 because people don't want 40; they want someone in their 30s for women. Like I've the number of times that my sort of, I did a music video where my husband was like 15 years older than me stage show that I just did he was older than me I wouldn't change it I've I loved loved working with Jace but like the discrepancy with age they say they want older and they don't so I've put my casting age up to 40 and I'm getting seen for older roles because this is this is what they want this is how they see a 40 year old <laughs> do you know what I mean it's warped so it's kind why, of why is that I don't know I'm really I'm not sure is that just really, that's just particular to female roles then? I think so. I, I I haven't got the male experience, but there is something about age. But what that well, is? I know. It's, is it not probably just you, the fact that if people are watching a show or watching a a couple, for example, the expectation is that if you're going to have the 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 male is a positive character, mm -hmm. that they're going to have. Uh, a partner, a wife or a girlfriend who's younger and good looking. I honestly, I couldn't. Otherwise, it doesn't tell. marry up. You yeah, know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Interesting. It's so it's so. It's I've I've yeah, but for me, I just I've kind of gone beyond questioning it because if you question it too much, you'll go loopy. <laughs> But, you know, if, at first I was like, oh, okay, I need to be this, I need to be this, I need to be this, I need to look like this, and da-da-da-da-da. Whereas now I'm like, just accept me for who I am, and if I'm not right for the role, that's fine. That's fine. Like, it's just a level of acceptance that it's not just about your talent. It's a jigsaw of, are you going to, Is you know, is the chemistry right with the rest of the cast? Does the, the aesthetic, does that make sense? And all this you know so many things it's not just your talent and so my kind of like mantra is if you don't book the job book the room so just make a good impression and if you don't get that particular job uh, hopefully they'll consider that's you that's a for great the next expression one. yeah that is a great expression yeah and there was another don't one that a job. friend jess another jess told me and it really shifted my mindset because you can't help but compare to other people. And when you see other people shooting up or other people getting these amazing opportunities and you're like, oh, it's, so you, you, you wish them well, but you're just like, I just wish I had a bit of that as well. Like just, ah. Oh. And she said, I've changed, I've changed my mindset from like that kind of like, oh, why them, not me to, I just wish I was up there with them. And so it's not about replacing people. It's not about kind of pissing on others to get where you want to be. It's just, just, I just want to join you up there.
And that was a huge shift for me. That was huge because it's comparison can kill you, I think, in any industry, right? Yeah, and I think that's definitely more a female thing as well with the comparisons. Really? I think so, yeah. I yeah. think so. It's, it, that, I mean, that conscious comparison yeah. of, am I like her? Yeah. Do I, why am I, why am I not like her? Why, yeah. yeah, exactly. The analysis. What, what is wrong with me? Yeah. Where it's not the case. Yeah. I, I say blokes do it as well, but probably to a, to a less extent. Um, but a lot of people like, to, they like to think, they like to shit on other people for success. Yeah. For success, and you definitely see that in your industry, for sure. Oh, it's for mad. Sure. Like just uh, what's what's the word? Um, just jealousy. Yeah, jealousy, and that will that ultimately that will that will hinder what you're capable of. Yeah, you know, if it's uh, there's so many with any industry, right? With anything, mm. anything you want to be successful in, there's so many moving parts and complexities to what to what is going to make you successful or not. From all of the physical, mental emotional attributes to everything outside of that the world the time the time and the place yeah. is half of it absolutely you know, what the industry is doing at the time yeah so difficult but if you um if you behold yourself to any of that negativity oh. that just completely impacts the way you you move forward yeah i, I mean it there was a point where it was like it was crippling for me it was quite early on and i was just like the comparison even, thing well just just feeling like you know, I wasn't getting in the room because of this, you know. Because of the way you looked. Yeah. And it's it's just, for me, acting is all about sort of embodying something. And that's not just a veneer. That's not just the outside. That's like embodying something. So for someone to not even consider, like like that director, not even consider my talent because they're like, oh, you just don't look right. And I, that took a long time for me to kind of work through. And I felt really self-conscious and it's like, it was yeah it was a really that's another problem with it isn't it it's yeah. the subjectivity of it the yeah. subjectivity of it people's personal tastes on things yeah. and you think and probably i mean in, in and in that circumstance like you're saying you're a slim lady you know what i mean it's like <laughs> what the fuck it's, yeah, and it's, it's like it, he perceives one thing but then how would how does it look on screen to or on stage to all of the other viewers who are watching it. Yeah. You know, because they're, they're, it's, it's, uh, I do tend to think sometimes, in, and especially where I work, which has nothing to do with what you do, there's, you tend to overanalyze things in certain areas mm -hmm. to the detriment of the effort and imp uh, the, the effort you're putting into overanalyzing yeah. something, which really is not going to be a drop in the ocean. It's not a showstopper. Yeah. You know, it's, people aren't even going to notice whatever it is you think you can see. Yeah. You know, I yeah. think. Is that, and that itself can be crippling and really uh, sure. stifle creativity something. just confidence it's that's the thing it's just the the impact that 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 the negativity and the kind of taking on board the criticism and the rejection can have is that you then go into the room with the energy of i'm not enough and they can sniff that a mile off and they can also it's like if you go in desperate like i really want this job for some reason they're like whoa this person's like it's just Whereas if you're, if you're able to just be yourself, they're the times that I really feel like I've nailed an audition and it's like, I've got a recall or I've got the job because I've just been able to go in and be like, you know, this is fun. This is, I'm here to, to help to be a part of this team. And it's not, you know, you, it, if you walk into the room being like, okay, five minutes of judgment, here we go. It, it's not, it's not the same approach at all and i just mm. think it's so important to just be yourself and just be confident in your abilities and i think that for me has taken a long time and i still like there are still times where i'm i struggle with like oh, did i do that well enough and it's like that little inner voice is it's never going to completely go away but if you can just put it in a box it's it makes the big difference with how yeah. you approach yeah i mean your self criticism is a requ is a required thing though right oh it's, it's yeah, just about it how far you, you take it yeah did i do it to the best of my ability yes i did oh maybe i did this right did i do that wrong what did you know did you say the lines correctly did you did you perf did you perform physically the way you want to you want to do that yes okay i'll shut the fuck up then because the rest yeah. is down to that subjectivity of That's... what because you may not get a part because the, the 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 casting director yeah is having a shit day <laughs> yeah. 
You know yeah. what I mean? That's it. <laughs> you, you could have lived you with that. that if you went in the next day or the day before, you could have got could have got apart. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm speaking with someone outside the industry. But it, no, but it is true. You just kind of, and also you could be having a shit day, and it's that you've done the prep, da da da. But on the way in, like you know, you were rubbed up against someone's armpit on the tube. Someone like was blaring their music, and it just like, and you, so you walk in a little bit, like, or you know, you have someone the t- the boss of the company that you're working at screaming at you in front of the rest of the workforce, and then you've got to go straight into the room stuff happens life happens and it's again it's just it's got to be water off a duck's back you can't let that gnaw away at you because otherwise you'll just be a little husk Mm. (laughs) but that's also it's also why i just love mocap is why i love voice work you it's what you can do on the mic mocap motion capture uh where you wear the again like the really attractive suit with the dots all over it it's very revealing but they're creating a character from that. Doesn't matter your height. It's it's just about what you're able to do physically, what you're able to do with your voice. So it's so freeing, and it's one of my favourite parts of the industry. And the people in that community are very different from the people in the acting world. It's it just feels more welcoming, warmer. It is more of a community. And in the mocap world, in mocap and voice, yeah. But, but do you think that's because? There's less ego at play because your face, you're not recognisable from the work you do. I think that's a lot to do with it. I, I really do. It's, yeah, I, it's just, I, th- I, I also feel like, I don't know, I, I've, it could just be my own experience, but everyone that I've worked with has just been really lovely. <laughs> it's just, egos are left at the door. It's, that's just my experience, maybe, but... It's why I'm particularly fond of voice and particularly fond of motion capture. It's like I've my experience with screen. I I was doing a special action job with um, uh, with firearms, and um, I won't. I was about to say the production. I was like, better not. But the director was being a dick. He was just being a dick. I'm going to be honest. And I was there. I actually had concussion at the time. I'd been hit by an electric bike that thought that the lights didn't apply to him and I was out for a run um and so I was kind of standing there feeling a bit woozy anyway but I was present I was there that was you know meant to be playing the security guard by the door and we were meant to do this extraction scene that got cut and so our role was sort of we basically were were extras with guns that's but uh there was a bit where the director said oh can you open the door I prefer the term supporting artist by the way supporting artist yes absolutely (laughs) do you know on for stage they're called supernumeraries Oh, were they? Yes. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Stage like, extras. Oh, go on. Super numerous. <laughs> but yeah, he said, oh, you know, when they all come in, can you open the door for them? Do you know how to open a door? And I was like... What? And he was, he was just... Because he thought that I was an extra, he was like, oh, do you know how to open a door? In front of an entire room of cast, crew... And he meant in the correct way for the screen, as, right? No, as in he meant are you capable of opening a door? Oh my God. And all people were going, <laughs> and I just looked at him, I went, yeah. And he was like, okay. And then the, one of the ADs came over and was like, so just making sure you know how to open it. I was like, I know how to open a door. A door? Yeah. And I noticed he didn't say it, he didn't say it to the six foot something Marine next to me, he said it to the woman. And like that for the rest of the day, just gnawed away at me. I was like, there's still, there's still something in this industry. So he's just, so he, his motivation was saying out just to be a dick yeah. basically. Cause he knows yeah. full well he can open a fucking yeah. door. Oh my God, just to be littlier. Yeah. For his. On set. For him to make himself feel better. Yeah. What a bellend. Absolutely. And I was there all day. I was like, fucking dare you? How dare you? And it's like, you know, I I don't like, I don't like screen because if I'd said something, they would have found a reason for me not to be needed for the rest of the day. Do you know what I mean? It's that kind of world. And that's why, yeah, I I love theatre, I love voice. I love mocap. It's just, if someone says something, I will just, and it doesn't happen, but if someone says something, I will call them out. In that situation, that particular director made it feel like there was a hierarchy. And I'm always a firm believer of the attitude of the set, of the workplace, whatever comes, filters from the top. My, the first thing I worked on, mm. the only thing I worked on, <laughs> was Slow Horses. As an ah, essay, wicked. as an essay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I did the first two seasons. Oh, as nice. an ex- it is an extra, but in a bunch yeah. of different stuff. Most of the things, I mean, in black kit and them, right? Yeah. I just did it for a grin. I didn't realise how many days it was going to be over, <laughs> over 18 months, right? But I, it was such, on the first series anyway, 
uh, first season and yeah, the second with the first because the directors changed. Mm. It was such a pleasant experience. Like I really enjoyed it. And what I got told uh, when I was talking to other essays who'd done stuff before, and one of the actors, Chris Rightly, who who is uh, who was just a, a great guy. I said, I think I know Chris. Is he uh, a Scottish actor? Oh, okay. Scottish actor. Yeah. Oh no, not who I'm thinking of. Okay, <laughs> and uh, sorry, um, but he was. Oh, they were saying in conversation like, no, 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 this is not normally what it's like. This this production is great. Mm. Everyone is awesome. It's just it's just a really good vibe. There's no arseholes. And I give an example. So. Uh, you know, we, we told don't bother the director, don't bother the the actors. You know, you, you don't speak to them. You're not allowed to speak to them unless it's part of a, for a role. You just leave them be. They're the pros. You and I, and I, I totally respect that. I, I, I respect. Yeah, that, right? I, I respect Especially that. Especially you got people like, like Gary Oldman and and Chris and Scott Thomas and that on, on set, right? Yeah. So one of the one of the essays, and we were all ex-military for this for the group of uh, guys for the group of characters we were. Mm -hmm. I use characters in a looser sense. <laughs> One of the essays, he was this Jamaican. Was he Jamaican? I think he was. Was he Jamaican? Anyway, uh, ex logistics core, just a wide boy, a wide boy, <laughs> right? And he was doing, he was doing Uber driving by night, and oh, when he was doing Uber driving when we weren't on set. He's one of those, just everything going at the same time. And I'm pretty sure he was still serving. Whoa. Uh, yeah. And one of the days he got on set and there was no coffee. So most days there's always coffee available for us to go and get. And there was no coffee and he was not happy. He's like, where's the fucking coffee? Where's the coffee? Where's the coffee? But he said, he's jokingly not happy. He's like, where's the coffee? Where's the coffee? The director comes wandering past. He's like, I can't remember the director's name. He says, ah, boss, there's no coffee. Any chance to get a coffee? We've been, we've been here for two hours. Any chance we can get coffee? And we're, the, the rest of it's us, like, are, we're yeah, crawling inside his hand. <laughs> oh my God, he's asking the director for the coffees. But that director went, no coffee. And he went off, got five coffees, and brought the coffees back for what us. A legend. And I was like, what a fucking dude. Absolutely What gorgeous. a dude. Yeah, yes. he, no, no issues. Also, there was no repercussions later on of us getting bollocked by a producer or anything he went coffees you should have coffees they've been here for ages went off and got them yeah it was not the case with the next director but i thought this industry is great mm -hmm. <laughs> you know from yeah. the other stories of it i know it's not always the case because people's egos get in the way absolutely and to yeah. be fair i've i've uh, just doing the sort of special action stuff with the firearms i've met some some supporting artists who are absolutely lovely a little bit kooky but genuinely lovely and some who you just go you're the reason ricky gervais did this show like, you are absolutely <laughs> yeah. yeah the extras wow. what a brilliant series that is so good yeah. and i didn't i didn't realize how accurate it was until some experiences there was there was one so i met this italian girl on set and I was doing an audiobook at the time that needed just a small amount of Italian. I can't do an Italian accent. So in those situations, I will just get friends to record it and I'll just do that bit, copying them. And so I asked if she'd do that. And she was like, oh, wow, my first script, my first. I was like, oh, no, no, you're not in it. I just need, if that's all right. She was like, yes, no, but this is so big. I was like, okay. So we went into this quiet area and I was recording her and I've still got the recording on my phone. So she had the the thing and she was recording it for me. And this guy came out and said, what, what's that? What, is that a script? What are you, what are you working on? What are you, is that, is, what's that for? Are you doing something outside of it? What, what, do you need a hand? Do you need anyone to read in for you? Literally, and then just completely tailored the conversation to his own career. <laughs> and it was, he then latched onto me as an industry connection. And he'd ask a question, but then answer it himself with his own experience. So he didn't, like, I'd go, and he got oh, because of what I, I I found in the industry, um, yeah, blah 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 blah. And I was just like, you just want, you just want a soundboard, sure, sure. Yeah, you do get all sorts. Oh it? wow! I mean, the thing is, with the, with the SA side of it, or the extra side of things, I think you know he did a day a standstill. It was like two hundred extras. It was loads of us. There were loads of us, and most yeah. of them they were only on set for that one day. They were just crowded, but we'd be on. We were sweats, so we'd be on like <laughs> loads of days with the same crew, and. Uh, and what I like, what what I found was most most of those people, they're there for a jolly. Yeah. They're going to go on set the day. It's a little bit boring. They're going to get paid some money, but they're doing something different. And it they can, it's a story they can tell. It's, yeah. it's a cool. And then some of the people, they're there because they want to get into the industry. Nothing wrong with that. No, but 
I think with going that route, so people who are going that route, it seems to me, and you may know better than I I do, seems to me that is is probably the only real route people have got to get into the industry who have got no previous connection. They've got no drama training, they've got no uh, drama school, they've got no existing connections in the industry. So they have, so they want to get into it and try and carve a route in as the easiest access to it is as an SA. Yeah, but it's it's not it's the tough. Best. I mean, the, there was one guy who um, he's he's been doing it for years and years and years, and I, I actually looked him up on IMDb. I was like, oh, wow, you've done. But he, so they call they call as you know they sort of call. Oh, we need these people for this scene, and they called up a load of people, and this guy said, oh well, they can't have um, the celebrity in this scene because I'm their main go-to as you know in this scene and it was just like this peacocking about being jet like being in the background they weren't they didn't have text with them it was not there was no interaction but they were just I don't know delusional I'm gonna say it they are like, what do you mean he was the main go-to as in he was saying that he was the big wig like he'd given himself a character within the scene that no one else had given him and he He's was just basically an saying yeah and okay. he was basically saying like, oh, well, no, they can't be having the, like, the star in this bit because I'm not in this bit. And like, I'm the, I can't remember, like, oh, himself, like the see. CEO of this, you know, he's a suit. And mm. and so he was, it's really, I'm trying so hard not to say who it is, what production it's on. But yeah, it's just, oh, wow. you get these egos and it's just fascinating. But then some people will just sit there and they bring in a book and they'll sit quietly, read their book. Oh, I'm needed. Cool. Yeah, fine go up, come back down, finish yeah. reading the book, you see them the next day, they're on to another one. And it's just, they're just chill. And it's like, it's just a bit different, different way of earning money. You get to see what life on set is like. But and yeah. it is fascinating. It, is it fa- really I, is, it, yeah. It is fascinating. The, I, I the, 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 behind, the behind the camera stuff, well, the, the job's there. Like, I, I, I hadn't, I'm glad I did it. Yeah. Because it gave me this insight in the TV and film, which I think, God, there's loads of people who are suited to this. They just, they're just sort of not aware of it, especially yeah. ex-military. And I've had a few people on now to try and to try and expose the industry as an option to ex-military folks. Yeah, yeah. fucking, I think we're perfect for a lot of it. And Absolutely. and uh, and even if you're not interested in any of the, the sort of the uh, the ego side, <laughs> you know, being in front of the camera, yeah. behind the camera, the technology now. Incredible. Oh my god! Incredible. And I the spent- number of people you need to do one scene, right? Well, I do think there are a little bit too many people on set a lot of the time. I did spend a lot of time looking around and going, uh, if we did a uh, little analysis of how many people are here and Versus. thought, let's run a little efficiency model to see how few people we need, change things a little bit, then yeah. it'd be a lot cheaper. Streamline, absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, Slow Horses was like £3 million. Pound, uh, three million it's pound, Apple TV, isn't it? Um, episode three or four million an episode something like that it was it was huge yeah it was huge it was huge yeah. it was huge wow yeah but then i suppose when you're having to close off a street in london for a 30 second scene which takes However, a day to shoot yeah. you know yeah, i know one guy he's um he's a stunty absolutely glorious guy and he oh did, a stunty a stunty yeah he did a scene in Oh, what's it called? Batman, uh, the Robert Pattinson one. You know the, uh, the scene that's in the trailer where Riddler's sitting with the coffee and the police come in and that yeah. took, I think that took like over a day to film because they were so specific. This needs to look, the shadow needs to oh, be wow. here. It's meticulous. Anything like sort of in those worlds, like the Batman, like the Marvel, that kind of stuff. It's so meticulous. Like Wonder Woman, I knew someone in that scene and she comes into the room, they're all, all the hostages, and she does look, 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 and then she does the shwing, and something bounces off her cool metal wrist thing. Again, that took like a day. Meticulous. And that's, again, it's like, it takes the joy out of it for me. I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by screen. It's a completely different skill set. You have to do stuff in the order of location, not in the sequ- sequential order of the story. So you've got to be able to get the emotion of having gone on a journey with a character for example mm. and you've only just started working with them and then you're doing the beginning bit of the you know it's all it can be very sort of mismatched it's fascinating i think it's such a skill and when people do it well i i genuinely applaud them but for me i love 
like having the narrative and having that kind of contact with people and having an audience there that's sort of not you know boom and and camera it's like having an actual audience reacting so yeah i think i'm i'm a theater and a voice baby yeah <laughs> Time. Yeah. What advice would you give someone who was looking to get into it themselves? I, at I any just think age, be, at, at any age. age, being curious is a really lovely trait to have, I think. And being, uh, you know, don't be afraid to ask people their experiences, like ask to shadow people and, you know, ask people for a coffee. Like I, the number of people who've come to me and said, can I just pick your brains about X, Y, and Z? I'm so happy to do it. Find your tribe within the industry. If you if you really want to go for it, find the people that keep you grounded and keep you sane and start from there. And, you know, there's so much to explore. There is, there are so many, especially with all the different medium media that are coming out now. Um, I just think be playful, explore, ask questions and just see what's for you but genuinely having the people there that ground you and that you can kind of have as the, the sort of release valve when things aren't going well, or, you know, when an audition that you really want, you've heard nothing and just, yeah, I think find your tribe. I think that's the main thing. What are you working on next? How can people keep an eye on what you're doing? Uh, I'm just about to go into rehearsals for Henry V, doing a schools tour with the Donmar Warehouse. And it's, I'm, uh, it's one of those rare occasions where like all of my skills have come in. So I speak French, Welsh accent, firearms they were interested in, Shakespeare touring experience, and they wanted someone tall. And I was like, bonjour, shamai, hello, pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> pew, pew. Yeah. Hang on a minute. Yeah. Henry V, yeah. they wanted firearms experience. What it's, production is this? <laughs> I know. Going into schools, I'm very intrigued, I have to say. But yeah, they said like, it would be yeah. a, a bonus. And um, yes, yeah, so it's based on the production that they did in house last year, which was uh, Modern Warfare. So it's soldiers. Uh, Henry is actually a sort of modern soldier rather than sort oh, of broadsword and chainmail. Yeah, so they're kind of modernising it. And so I'm playing soldiers, um, politicians. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. A lot of role playing. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. That sounds really good. Yeah. Sounds really good. It's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Um, Thank you. What, uh, hang on, how can people follow you? Oh, at Jess Nesling on Instagram and Twitter. J E S S N E S L I N G. That's me. Amazing. Thanks for your time. Thank we you. should do this again. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love that. Yes. <laughs> right. We are done. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Dialch.